after 4.30, so we can start the session. I see more people coming in. Uh, for us at INA, this is um, a really interesting session. I have to tell you that this session was added at the last minute of the program. And after, after adding in, we have a new edition at the end, which I keep it as a surprise. Um, but um, we wanted uh, INA attendees, uh, INA 2022 attendees, to hear from experts who have been working on matters related to the war in Ukraine. So among others, you will hear about building resilience, tackling disinformation, and supporting refugees. My name is Dimitri Piros, and I'm the president of INA, and I'm happy to introduce the speakers and invite them to come up on stage. So let me first invite uh, Dmitry Teperik, uh, Resilient Ukraine Program Director, Chief Executive, International Center for Defense and Security. Dmitry, have a seat. Uh, second, I'd like to invite Christian Poirel, Chief Physician, and Laura Duto, Fire and Rescue Service of uh, Bouche du Rhone from France. You could recognize the uniforms, I'm sure. Then I'd like to invite uh, Roman Adamczyk, Analyst, Institute for Tra Strategic Dialogue. And finally, the surprise I was talking about Micah Berman from Google, Product Manager, Android Safety. So, let's not um, delay. Dmitry Teperik is going to talk about strengths and vulnerabilities of community resilience in Ukraine. Dmitry, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. And it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I have been asked, uh, I am from Ukraine. Uh, no, I am not from Ukraine, but I am here on behalf of Ukraine, on behalf of those Ukrainians, brave Ukrainians, who are now actually uh, fighting uh, the war. So I'm a, I myself uh, from, uh, from Estonia, a small country uh, in the north. And of course, it's very challenging for me now to speak very quickly, uh, because my time is uh, very uh, limited. Uh, Yes, uh, unfortunately, the term of resilience, I mean, the phenomenon of uh, resilience <coughs> uh, has been spoiled by uh, various, various bureaucrats and politicians because they adopted that and now it's almost uh, in every, I don't know, political document. But uh, as, of course, you as practitioners, uh, you know that resilience is a very practical concept based on uh, actual crisis preparedness and uh, that we are uh, or we have been doing uh, uh, in Ukraine uh, since uh, 2016. So very quickly uh, about uh, our, uh, our program and uh, our uh, research because uh, being also a very practical uh, concept, uh, resilience is also uh, evidence and uh, research based uh, approach uh, to, uh, to various aspects. Uh, I come from, from Tallinn, from, from Estonia, and uh, I'm chief executive of a government-established think tank. We are not part of the government, but we work very closely with the Estonian government and different, uh, uh, different ministers there, basically uh, providing uh, so-called second-best opinion on uh, security, defense, and foreign policy-related uh, issues. And uh, since uh, uh, 2016, uh, with the support of the Estonian Minister of Foreign Affairs, we established a program called Resilient Ukraine, uh, and it uh, aims at uh, developing standards for measuring societal resilience uh, in Ukraine. And for that, we are conducting qualitative and quantitative uh, research on different, uh, uh, different issues. But we are not just a thin tank, but we also think and do tank which means that uh, we also do a lot of uh, outreach activities, not uh, just in my country, Estonia, but also in Ukraine, in order to raise awareness about uh, uh, resilience-related issues uh, on local, regional, and, and national level. And uh, lastly, we also incorporated in our program activities related uh, uh, to law enforcement agencies uh, and uh, different security and rescue agencies in Ukraine, 
in order to strengthen horizontal communication uh, and partnership between uh, Ukrainian citizens uh, and, uh, and the state. And of course, just to remind you, because here in Marseille, with this nice weather, we, uh, we might forget uh, uh, the fact that actually Ukrainian people, as we speak, uh, they uh, are fighting for their survival, and of course, they're fighting, fighting for indep independence of, of the nation, and uh, they also fight for the uh, future within uh, the European family, uh, which uh, they deserve. Uh, here comes uh, some, of course not all, but just some results uh, from uh, our uh, studies and research work we did on resilience uh, since uh, 2019. Uh, so on the map you can see basically the areas we uh, covered uh, by sociological research uh, and but also uh, by different uh, data collect, uh, collecting methods. So mostly the areas in uh, eastern and southern uh, regions uh, of Ukraine, uh, which uh, now are either occupied or being, uh, uh, being a front line there. And <clears throat> just uh, for uh, your background knowledge, what kind of indicators uh, we were uh, studying uh, in Ukraine, uh, of course, uh, different levels of uh, threat awareness and threat perceptions by the population, also uh, professional competences of uh, local governance uh, and people are uh, involved in decision making, basically their professional competences. Also development, development perspective and management quality on a local and regional level, uh, information consumption uh, of uh, Ukrainian citizens, uh, their political activity and their attitudes toward uh, the Ukrainian states, but also uh, ability uh, to act uh, according uh, to crisis management. So basically, uh, do they have some specific uh, skills which will be useful during, during a crisis? We also studied uh, profoundly uh, media landscape and media consumptions of uh, those citizens who live in uh, Eastern and Southern Ukraine. Al also studied the geopolitical orientation and perceptions uh, and uh, cognitive world image and civil self-identification. So Ukraine is a very diverse country and uh, it is kind of puzzle, it is kind of, kind of mosaic uh, to put all the factors together and uh, to understand, uh, because the end goal is basically to understand how uh, individuals will behave during a crisis, uh, what kind of factors might uh, affect uh, their behavior uh, during a crisis on individual level and uh, on also on the level of, uh, of communities. Well, we have some uh, insights. A very large report was published uh, uh, last year, but then, of course, it happened before the war. And, uh, and before the war, uh, so many Ukrainians actually didn't consider their uh, physical security as, uh, uh, as a priority. Uh, so problems of ecology, economy, corruption and other, uh, let's say, public safety uh, issues uh, ranked uh, much higher uh, than physical security or indication of the war, which of course uh, changed since uh, uh, February 24. Uh, well, we also managed uh, to uh, convince uh, local authorities in Ukraine that national resilience there uh, does not and cannot have kind of single primary owner uh, and that actually it's responsibility uh, of different uh, various stakeholders on different levels, including, of course, law enforcement agency, but also uh, media and uh, civil society organizations and community, uh, community leaders. And that's the reason why we, we promoted the model, uh, kind of partnership model between uh, different uh, stakeholders. Uh, uh, last year, we also did a very uh, large uh, sociological service uh, in the places you can uh, you can read. Well, unfortunately, a place like Mariupol basically doesn't exist anymore uh, and some other uh, cities are just, uh, just destroyed or occupied. Uh, we also managed uh, to conduct a lot of uh, focus group interview with the Ukrainian youth uh, because one part of the uh, national resilience is actually having a positive credo, a better outlook uh, for uh, a better more prosperous uh, future, and it's very much, very much correlates uh, with the things that young people uh, do uh, or uh, don't.
basically uh, how they how the perceptions can uh, shape uh, countries um, and uh, regions or, or communities uh, outlook and the third pillar uh, we exercise to be the law enforcement agencies uh, it's basically simulation based crisis stop exercises but not just between the law enforcement agencies which are just a regular practice there but uh, uh, we involved uh, civil society organizations, uh, journalists, uh, local authorities. So we made it as indisciplinar and cross-sectoral uh, as possible, basically bringing people uh, outside their uh, comfort zone, be giving them uh, uh, some, uh, some scenarios and yeah, improving uh, their uh, horizontal communication and, and networking skills. So we managed to do that, uh, uh, these exercises in um, uh, two cities in uh, in the north of Ukraine, Sumy, uh, which was under occupation, and in uh, in, in Dnipro, uh, and uh, then then the war started. But we managed to collect uh, some interesting uh, insight and basically feedback from uh, law enforcement officers and uh, uh, just uh, uh, yeah, journalists and people from um, civil society what they see as obstacles for um, uh, communication uh, for cooperation. During uh, during a crisis, well, uh, there are of course uh, some uh, communication gaps, and uh, uh, I see so the clock is running. So uh, I just encourage you, of course, uh, to uh, to read the study which is available there. Uh, just uh, also some data from uh, from different cities uh, in Ukraine. As you see, the picture uh, uh, is very very diverse. So uh, the attitude towards the Ukrainian state as such among Ukrainians uh, wasn't uh, kind of uh, solid uh, or, or monolithic. Uh, it uh, varied uh, in different places, uh, in, in different cities. Uh, but uh, it will be, of course, very interesting uh, to learn how the picture changed after the, uh, after the Russian aggression. And uh, also we, uh, so we measured uh, or asked uh, asked the people uh, about the willingness to participate in uh, defense activities uh, if uh, uh, Ukraine would be under uh, aggression, and again, so the picture was wasn't so monolithic uh, as actually uh, it was proven uh, in uh, February and, and March. So my message is that uh, many practical aspects of national resilience uh, in Ukraine are now being uh, challenged and 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 tested. Unfortunately, of course, uh, but uh, they are now be being tested and challenged uh, during a war, which means that uh, they generate a lot of uh, they generate a lot of data, and of course, Ukrainians, our Ukrainian friends and colleagues, are just uh, too busy uh, to gather and analyze the, the data. Uh, but uh, we are there to help them as much as is possible, because all the factors and practical aspects of resilience, as I said are being now uh, being untested. So at this moment, uh, what kind of strengths and gaps in community resilience uh, identified by us? Uh, so uh, so good things are strengths that uh, during crisis, uh, citizens demonstrated ability to cooperate and, uh, and interact. And uh, of course, they uh, understand that uh, very much depend uh, on their own uh, awareness and depend on their uh, skills. Uh, they uh, don't uh, see kind of strong dependence uh, on the Ukrainian state. So in many places uh, in Ukraine, they basically uh, initiated uh, a lot of uh, kind of uh, self-helping uh, initiatives and uh, it helped them uh, very much. Uh, about gaps, uh, I would just underline one. Uh, I returned from uh, from Ukraine uh, three weeks ago. Uh, I was uh, with my team in uh, in Western Ukraine. Uh, so the Western Ukraine now is a region where a lot of uh, a lot of refugees came, and uh, of course uh, uh, there is a, a big uh, a big pressure and actually. Also, social pressure, not just on infrastructure, but uh, on uh, on the populations. So there are already uh, some uh, indicators uh, that uh, some uh, intergroup conflicts uh, might uh, arise there. But for you, uh, as law enforcement officers, I think it's very important or maybe interesting to know 
that your colleagues there accept, accept uh, so the military servicemen, but uh, your colleagues from uh, police, from rescue services, from basically frontline officers, uh, they don't uh, get any any mental health advice or any any psychological help. So uh, what we uh, f found in uh, our fact-finding mission uh, in, uh, in in Western Ukraine, I just underline it's. Uh, uh, is area not under uh, occupation or direct bombardment. So in Western Ukraine, uh, they are basically working uh, on uh, the breach of uh, burning out. And it's a very, uh, very serious issue. So we, uh, we tried uh, uh, to, to map the, uh, the needs in terms of uh, mental health training and uh, basically now trying to connect the dots be between those uh, experts and specialists uh, in crisis uh, psychology and uh, those who need that help in uh, in this uh, in these areas. Uh, just briefly, uh, some conclusions and uh, and recommendations. Uh, so uh, we think that demand for internal security, public safety, and of course its civilian components uh, will increase in Ukraine. So volunteer fire brigades, assistance to the police and, and territorial defense. So of course the war will uh, end someday and we will sure uh, it uh, will end with Ukraine, Ukraine's win, victory, uh, which means uh, that uh, recovery, recovery process and uh, all the, everything is related to public uh, security and, and safety will be uh, a high priority. Uh, of course, that means that demand for effective trust-based crisis communication uh, on these issues uh, uh, then will increase also among uh, citizens of Ukraine. And then, uh, just to underline that uh, many good examples, uh, or not so good examples, uh, gaps uh, identified during a war should be profoundly uh, studied uh, in order to, to validate uh, different yeah, aspects uh, and factors of uh, of resilience. So now basically we are talking about a kind of unique window of opportunity for Ukraine and actually the European Union. So uh, it might be a kind of political statement, but still we uh, need uh, to support the speedy reforms in various key areas there, uh, well, especially in, uh, in defense and civil protection and uh, public uh, safety sectors. Uh, we as friends of Ukraine uh, uh, in the European Union should ensure recovery instruments for the country and then of course to enhance uh, mutual learning on practical resilience. Well, I'm sure that Ukrainians will have a lot of uh, practical experience uh, to share with you and uh, I think uh, we will be ready uh, to, to learn from that. Uh, and then basically uh, together with them to elaborate on best practices for internal security and public safety. As noted, our uh, research is publicly available uh, uh, in, uh, in English, uh, more, uh, more to come. And of course, thank you for uh, your uh, attention. Thank you. Indeed, very interesting. Um, is there a question from the audience, please? Okay. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'd like to ask, you spoke about uh, fire services, uh, uh, security services. Uh, um, uh, what, do you have any information about the um, ambulance infrastructure? How is that affected? And is there a volunteer service for that? I have no information on that. Uh, so we work with law enforcement agencies and those uh, who are kind of uh, first line uh, Officer, so yeah, first okay. life reporter, except uh, except medics, but uh, it's my impression that uh, they are overloaded uh, in in any cases. Um, I see a hand there. Hi, Stephen Hines from London Ambulance Service. Um, the UK government made quite a big thing about sending UK ambulances out to Ukraine. Um, with footage coming from the media of at least one of them being blown up the same day they arrived. Um, was it a good idea to sort of send them what effectively we would use in a peace setting as high visibility marks, luminous vehicles into a war setting? Okay. Uh, anybody else?
Okay, um, shall we move forward then? Um, report of the humanitarian operation Pompier de la Paix, Peace Fighters. We start with uh, Christian Poirel, uh, chief physician, a colleague, and Laura Duto from the Fire and Rescue Service of uh, Bouche du Rhone from France. Please. Um, so, good afternoon. Um, so, we, Dr. Poirel and I, are uh, part of the Fire and Rescue Service in uh, Bouche du Rhone. Uh, first, we wanted to thank uh, Ina for giving us the opportunity to share with you our, what we've experienced and our um, modest uh, participation in the effort of helping Ukraine and the Ukrainians. Um, so, about peace firefighters, I will just present the, the concept and then uh, get into more details about the Ukrainian mission and how it was conducted. So, Peace Firefighters, um, it's an action carried out for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was coordinated with the Interministerial Crisis Unit, uh, located at the Ministry of the Interior. It's supervised by the National Federation of French Firefighters, and it was organized with the help of uh, local firefighters unions uh, in France. So what is special about this mission is that it's the first humanitarian mission that was organized by the Federation. Um, so it had a lot of meaning to be involved in uh, helping and being a part of the general effort for, for helping uh, a friendly, uh, a friendly uh, country in Europe. Um, more about the, the mission, the Ukrainian mission, there were three objectives. Uh, collect and transport fire and emergency care equipment um, to the conflict zone. We were also there to support refugees and direct them to reception areas on site and to contribute to welcoming in France the families of Ukrainian firemen mobilized on the front line. So I remember um, during the, the convoy, um, uh, during the convoy, uh, just before we, we crossed the Polish border and entered uh, Poland, um, the head of detachment explaining to us that we were here to support, um, to support what was already organized or being implemented and not to supervise or organize uh, ourselves. So it was really in the meaning of helping and supporting what was already in place. And it's different. Um, there were an upstream preparation, so there were an assessment team uh, going at the border uh, earlier in March. Mm -hmm. They were there to quantify the needs and connect with uh, local authorities as well as uh, the French embassy in Poland. And they also worked in organizing the, the logistics, the logistics sorry, of a convoy. So the first convoy and team we've been part, both part of, uh, we were there from March 11th to March uh, 23rd. Uh, we were sent to Budomirch um, at, the, at the border uh, on the Polish side. And uh, we left on March um, 12th at the house of the firemen of France in Paris. Uh, there were 13 vehicles, um, so passenger vehicles such as nine-seaters um, nine and also ambulances. And all the vehicles were um, full of um, donation we gathered before. Um, there were 35 voluntary personnel, one doctor, so Dr. Poirel here, uh, three nurses and 31 firefighters. Uh, there were both voluntary and professional firefighters. And as I said before, it was all organized with the help of local firefighter unions. So you had firefighters coming from all over France to be part of the convoy. Um, on site, when we arrived, we had different mission. Uh, we had to sort the nation. So we retrieved uh, clothes, emergency care equipment, fire equipment, medication and we have to sort them out and regroup them in order to give them to the um, Polish uh, fire department. 
and the Polish fire department proceeded to give them to the Ukrainian firefighters. We also had, uh, had been working at Budomirch crossing point. Um, we were bringing guidance to the refugees, so what was available at the crossing camp, uh, what could be the next step for them. Uh, we were also providing medical care within tent, so there were always um, the doctor or nurses on site at the camp. Uh, we did not face war injuries. It was mainly hypothermia, dehydration, exhaustion, and treatment break. Um, so people living in a hurry and they don't have their treatment for high blood pressure. Um, we were also here for psy psychological support for the Ukrainian uh, that needed it. So here you have a look at the medical tents. We had a lot of material, drug, medication. And on the right side, you can see paper. Um, it's um, the main medical question we would ask, translated both in Ukrainian and Polish, um, in order to, ex to exchange with the um, Ukrainian refugees. Um, we were also trying to provide a brief distraction for children because for the context, so the first picture on the left, you have the border. So on the Ukrainian side, you have the, the men saying goodbye to their wife and children. Um, they cannot cross the border um, because of the general mobilization law. So they have to stay and watch their wife, wife and children cross. And Sorry. <coughs> and um, 200 meters from there, we were, sorry, excuse me. <laughs> We were at the camp and it was um, a really emotional atmosphere uh, for them and we were trying to um, distract the children and bring comfort for the women because they just uh, flee their country and they had to face um, the unknown. Um, on site we were also offering shuttles, so we had uh, nine seaters and there were a five minute drive to a reception point. So at the reception point, they could stay for up to three days. Um, they had food, they had um, showers, beds. Uh, they could be uh, guided on whether, um, what would be the next step, what would be the next uh, country to go. Uh, we had an hour drive to a train station uh, because some of them arrived, they already had plans. They wanted to go further into Europe, so we just uh, led them to the train station and they would leave the, um, the country really quickly. Uh, and we were also offering shuttles to a specific address in a few cases. Um, the doctor and a few team members were also part of um, data gathering and situation assessment. Uh, we were in a really dynamic situation on the um, Ukrainian side and on the Polish side. Because on the Polish side, um, there were a lot of new organization arriving and setting up tents and, uh, and arriving with new resources and competencies. So it was really dynamic. And it was difficult to forecast the refugees' uh, flows depending on how the situation would evolve in, uh, in Ukraine. So they investigated uh, four um, crossing points, Erben, Budomirch, Medica, and Kroshenko. And if you, I don't know if you've seen a bit of um, pictures in Medica, but it was um, soon after the, the refugees arrived. There were a lot of organization arriving in Medica and a lot of tents and then kept multiplying. So when we went there, it was like a bit of fair uh, with people dressing up to welcome children. Uh, you had Jack Sparrow and Santa Claus. So it was like a fair, a lot of people helping. And on the other side, you have crossing point when you only have a few tents. You don't have the same resources and the same people to help uh, welcome the Ukrainians. 
So it was all about cooperation uh, with local authorities, um, police, fire departments, obviously, French uh, and local and foreign NGOs, and everyone was uh, bringing their competences, whether it was cooking and bringing food or uh, um, bringing uh, donations, um, offering shuttles. So everyone was just cooperating to, to help the most we can. And it's part of the experience feedback. So when we, we let the, this, the camp for the, the next team, um, we, the project objective didn't change. We had to, to help on site and offer shuttles and medical uh, attention. Um, the perimeter were a bit uh, extended because a, a part of the team was sent to Kroshenko to help the um, Polish fire departments. Uh, the resources, well, we, we, we left uh, all the vehicles there and uh, the, the context was still really dynamic, a situation really dynamic both on both sides. So it was shared um, with the next team, obviously, and this is really useful for, useful for the National Federation because it's, it would make us more efficient and, and really um, more helpful for organizing a future mission if, uh, if it came to be all the mission there. So that's all for the Peace Firefighters. And uh, here is the contact details for Dr. Pryor if you'd like to connect about the mission. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, Peace Firefighters. Uh, that definitely. Um, okay. Uh, any questions for the French firefighters? Okay, uh, quick question from myself. You also said that uh, you were looking for um, families of uh, Ukrainian firefighters um, to support those families. Uh, were you able to identify families like that and even bring somebody to France or... It's working, it's working. Um, so at the border, we were not uh, connecting with families, but there is a, a special organization um, uh, like supervising the... the okay, the thank you for that, yeah. thank you. Okay, um, we move forward, uh, having time in mind. Oh, actually, um, uh, let me... Uh, give an answer to Stephen. Stephen, you asked a question that I don't think we're qualified to answer, and that's why I passed it. Uh, I don't know the needs, and obviously the, the an obvious question was anything will help. But on the other hand, you know, I, I, Dimitri already said that he doesn't in, have information about the pre-hospital health sector, and that's why I didn't reply, just to, to be sure that uh, um, we didn't, intentionally um, get past your uh, question. All right, exploring disinformation tactics and its impact on emergency services. I'm really looking forward to hearing Roman um, Adamczyk, Analyst Institute for Strategic Dialogue to give the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Roman Adamczyk. Uh, as you are going to recognize with um, my accent, I'm a bit French. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about this information. Uh, so I'm an analyst for the Institute for Strategic uh, Dialogue, focusing on uh, disinformation and uh, extremism. I'm also an open source uh, investigator and I, I worked on some investigation on uh, Russian disinformation. So I have some knowledge about Russian disinformation, but just for the context, I'm not a specialist of Ukraine. So when, when I started to prepare this, pre uh, to prepare this uh, presentation, I was thinking of uh, how to make it useful, especially because uh, I had in mind the tragic story of uh, James Lemessurier, the head of the White Helmet, and how disinformation can impact a conflict 
and how we can have a real impact on emergency services, um, tragic impact on them. So, uh, so I wanted really to mix at the same time talking about Ukraine, but also thinking about how uh, we can think about this information when you, when you work in an emergency service and uh, how to fight uh, to protect yourself against it. So to start with, uh, to start with my presentation, I think it's important to understand that uh, disinformation in the context of war uh, is going to be very efficient and you are in the situation in war where uh, it's an emotional situation, so it's the first criteria that is important for disinformation when there is an emotional situation, people want to know information, they are looking for answers, and bad actors are, de are there to push their narratives and try to polarize situation. The second uh, important thing to have in mind is that uh, war, war and the war in Ukraine is a good example of that. There is a lot of uncertainty and the uh, information, and more importantly, the disinformation is circulating faster uh, than, uh, than real information, so people are going to, to take advantage of the uncertainty to push their messages, uh, especially now it's really in real time. Uh, we have seen, for example, attacks against a train station, and 10 minutes after you have already messages from the Russian state targeting uh, some population. And the uh, final thing to keep in mind, it's really that uh, because uh, emergency services are going to be trusted sources, sources of information, they are going to be attacked uh, a, bit, uh, a bit more because if you want, for example, if you're the Russian state and you want to, uh, to push your narratives and for example, the fact that you are not as bad as what you do on the ground, so you are not, at, you are not for example, attacking civilians. Uh, emergency services are going to be a problem for you because they are going to show the reality on the ground, so they are more likely to face attacks, attacks to, uh, to create distrust against them and to, um, and, yeah, to attack their legitimacy. Uh, I don't know why it's this slide. Okay. Okay, I will uh, forget about this slide because it was definitely not supposed to be the fourth one, but I will try to continue a bit without uh, the other one. Uh, I think uh, uh, then one, uh, one important thing, uh, especially the, that is uh, especially important with Russia and the Ukrainian war, is really that uh, sometimes this information is really more about creating distrust than really pushing a coherent message. For example, you have all seen the atrocity uh, in the city of Bucha. Uh, what we have seen uh, after the first media reports about uh, these atrocities is really pro-Russian actors pushing a lot of different messages like the dead people on, on, uh, in, the, in the TV reports were not dead. That was one way to try to create this distrust. But then they changed and they said that uh, all the cops might have, be brought, might have been brought uh, by, the, by the Ukrainian forces. Then, then they ended to say that all these people were killed by the Ukrainian forces and were from Bucha but were killed by the Ukrainian forces because they, because they collaborated with the Russian uh, army. So as you can see, you are going to, you are going to create a lot of, uh, um, of narratives and you are going to, ah, and here we go. And, uh, and with all this narrative, it's not about having something coherent, it's really to create distrust so, uh, so people are not going to believe what, uh, what uh, the authorities are saying. Uh, 
Also, one, uh, one uh, important thing around the Ukrainian war to understand is that some networks are very well organized, uh, and uh, especially between countries, uh, all this disinformation uh, didn't, st all this disinformation network didn't start it for, from scratch. And for example, uh, you have people Sometimes they collaborate, uh, they have more connections, they have a lot of connections in, uh, with Russia, sometimes not, but they are just really involved into pushing anti-system narratives, disinformation against the US or these kind of things. So they are going to really to push all the messages very quickly and in uh, one day or two days. You can, uh, you can see mis disinformation from Russia arriving in some conspiracy websites in France. Uh, and uh, so this is going very quickly. And uh, what is important to understand also with all this disinformation is that it can play on a lot of criteria, on a lot of parameters. Uh, here you have, uh, you have uh, some uh, example of typology. Uh, created by an organization called First Draft. And so the disinformation is not going, is going to take advantage of everything. It's not always about fabricating something, but using the context, for example, changing a bit of the context to give another meaning to a piece of information. It's going to be to impersonate some organization, and I'm going to talk a bit uh, later about it. It's going to be also, uh, yeah, about really playing on all sorts of details uh, to try to push your messages. And when you are working for an emergency service, the first thing and important thing uh, to fight this disinformation especially, uh, is to have a presence online with accounts certified. And it's really important because, as I said, when you have some, uh, when you have a, a crisis or you have an emergency, people are going to look for this informa for information online, and if they don't find someone uh, a certified source, they might end up look for accounts pushing this information. So this is a first step and important one. Uh, then uh, the, it is important also uh, to understand that uh, it's difficult, as I said, especially when you, you talk about Russian disinformation, they are going to push tons of narratives, tons of different messages, and it's really difficult to try to counter all of them all of them, and uh, if, you, if you start to spend your time uh, thinking, yeah, now they are pushing that, I need to push that against it, it's not going to work. And what is important is first to focus on your own communication, and uh, especially to think about uh, all, uh, uh, all I said about, uh, about disinformation actors exploiting some details about context, incoherence, trying to take uh, advantage of unknown things. So you have to keep this in mind in your communication. So don't go too fast, because if you make a mistake, this one is going to be uh, exploited very quickly. And, uh, and you see it's a, it's a different context, but for example, uh, for the French elections, so very recent uh, event, uh, one French TV made a mistake with some figures about the results. And of course, this is the only thing now we have in conspiracy communities. So this information often doesn't start from scratch, so you have really to be careful with what you push. Uh, and you, also it's important to highlight what is unknown because people are going, to, uh, especially on crises and emergencies, people are going to, are going to try to push some specific uh, messages because we don't know, for example, if you take another crisis, the fire at Notre Dame, uh, when we didn't know the origin of the fire, there were tons of hypotheses and people trying to push in messages against migrants, uh, saying it was a terrorist attack. 
And so it's important to say when you communicate, this is the information we have. And sometimes if you feel like that there is some details that can be exploited, you should say, we don't know about it. But we don't know about this is a way to avoid the exploitation of uh, information gap. Uh, then one, uh, one thing, uh, you, you, when you are targeted by this information, you are really tempted to answer. Uh, to a lot of bad messages and uh, everything. Uh, it's not always the best practice, uh, especially because uh, disinformation actors they, uh, or people who, tw who try to harass you, they want to have visibility. <laughs> and by responding to them, sometimes you are going to give them more visibility than what they would have, uh, well, they would have had uh, by pushing only your message. And, uh, and I, I put here an example of uh, not we, uh, from the French uh, health ministry during the COVID crisis, and it was not a, an example to follow. So they, they wanted, to, they wanted to, to, do, to counter this information, so they made a fact check about uh, the fact that you shouldn't use cocaine to cure COVID-19, which is not a... Uh, I mean, most people uh, didn't, need to, <laughs> didn't need the fact check to know that. And at the end, you had really a, you had really a problem here because but you want to fight this information, but you amplify something that not a lot of people are going to believe. And, uh, and even you, de you delegitimate your further messages that you are going to push. And that is uh, an issue. Uh, but one way to uh, one way to still counter some disinformation uh, is collaboration, uh, because there are a lot of civil society organizations, media uh, that can help you to push your own your messages. Uh, for example, fact checkers they can uh, they can help you with on the, uh, with that uh, if you uh, if you give your position on some event when there is disinformation, your position is going to be, to be put forward. And to finish, and uh, I think it's an important uh, thing to keep in mind, is that disinformation, uh, uh, and uh, especially Russian one lately, uh, they don't hesitate to, to target specific people uh, to, to, like I said, to sow this distrust. So you are going to say that uh, a firefighter might be uh, also, uh, also fighting with some militia in Ukraine. Uh, you are going to use, uh, you are going to try to find anything to sow distrust. So targeting individual can help uh, with, the, with that. Uh, we have seen also in Mariupol, for example, in the maternity. With, uh, with this uh, woman being targeted specifically because she had an Instagram account and uh, she was accused to be an actress. And, uh, and so this, you need, you need to keep this in mind when you work, uh, you work in an emergency service too, that your team can be targeted and you need to think on how to protect them against that, uh, which means first, uh, thinking about uh, about the privacy of social media accounts, so here it's uh, it's quite important to to try to have some trainings or at least some uh, guidelines to help your team manage that. Uh, then, if something happens, it's also important to to that you support people that can be targeted by this information. Uh, even, even myself, uh, in, my, in some of my organization where I worked, uh, we were targeted by this information. And when you are targeted personally, sometimes you want to respond to everyone. And, and like I said, it's also not a good practice because there is, there is a risk of uh, amplifying the problem more than anything else. And so, yeah, uh, to finish, it's if you can have uh, one training in your organization about this issue and how uh, these issues and how to handle these issues, 
it's really it's really important because uh, uh, when you are in the situation of crisis and facing disinformation attacks, uh, then it's a bit too late to learn how to react. Thank you. I like the last sentence. If you're already attacked and you don't know how to deal with it, it's too late. Um, any questions? Comments? Yes. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm Gary uh, at INA. Uh, I used to work with Roman in another organization on disinformation as well, for which I still work as well. And uh, I just want to emphasize uh, how much what uh, Roman said about um, Sometimes you need to, f to basically fill the space as well. Not always, you don't need to respond to everything that is online, that would be a big mistake, by the way. But sometimes, you know, there is a culture in emergency services, which is of course that we want to get the approval of the minister before saying something, or we need to go up the, the chain of command before saying something. And as long as we don't know, we will not communicate. And this space, this void is being used by all these people to create the narrative, we saw it recently again, uh, thinking about what happened I think in Nice with Eric Ciotti uh, a few days ago. <laughs> and, but it's important that you feel the space to say, with, with uh, modesty, we right now, we don't know, and the forces just don't know uh, how many qu casualties we have or what happened and so on. And, and not knowing is nothing bad. Not knowing is part of the of a communication plan where you say, we don't know, we will know, but it's right now too early to, to say. I, I would just emphasize this very point to fill the space. Thank you. Uh, one question over there or comment? Hi, question. Uh, Alfonso Zarmaro uh, from Umblr. So uh, following a bit on this topic, so what's the, the moment where uh, you decide, okay, I really need to answer to this disinformation? Isn't it? Because sometimes it's the uh, yeah, people that are attacking you that are saying this, but at some point this becomes a rumor. No, following a bit on the this Ukrainian crisis um, on the Polish side, and when many people are talking about how Red Cross is not there and they're creating um, concentration camps in Russia because uh, the Red Cross president went to meet uh, in Moscow, and they're just seeing that part. So there is a point where all this institution is affected. No, so what's the point of okay? I really need to answer. Uh, to this or not, because otherwise you leave an uh, emptiness there for people yeah. to believe it. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Yeah, <laughs> it's a difficult question, but uh, I mean, first you, you need to think about, uh, you need to try to investigate at least, at least a bit what you see online, meaning looking if there is really a lot of videos and looking at metrics. And, uh, and especially uh, looking at uh, who is amplifying it. Because if it's, uh, if it, for example, if uh, it stays online uh, and you don't have, uh, and you don't see really the impact on the, on the ground, uh, there, there is already a bit, uh, there is, there is, I mean, I mean when, when you see it on the ground, for example, and when it, uh, you feel the impact, direct impact, some people coming to you repeating this disinformation, for sure, this is the time uh, where you should act uh, because it means that uh, this thing is circulating and you don't want, and you want to counter it. I mean, it's, it's really about seeing the impact and I think the other thing to keep in mind, it's really wh which type of disinformation. And uh, there is, things where you know in my organization I have enough to I have enough to say this is false, one hundred percent false. And there we, there are other things where it's more matter there could be some it's more matter of context, of details, it, there could be a part of opinion here. And here it's more tricky and uh, you sh should try to avoid to enter into too many de debates about uh, how to interpret facts. It's really, the, it's really about the impact and if you can say is it, it's totally false, for me at least. But it's not an easy question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, yes. So thank you, yes, uh, anybody who is uh, 
experience uh, in crisis management knows that uh, what you say, uh, said is true, that you have to occupy the mediatic field just uh, if, even if you don't know nothing, just to say that the authorities are in charge and they are doing something. And it's, it's very important and it's very important to to ask for the support of the third party. I mean the, the divorced virtual operation, special, uh, the visa of in French, I mean people on the social networks, uh, the, the MSGU unit, which is very active in the bouche du rhone Fire Department Service, which is exemplar, which is modeling in, in, to this regard. Uh, it's very important to having a third party who is uh, conveying uh, a renewed right to, 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 to the speech of the public authorities. But in this case, in the Ukrainian case, I think it's quite different. It is not uh, something spontaneous. This is something which is deliberately planned to harm, which uh, belongs to an old culture. I don't making any politics, I'm just making political science, just to see what, what has been written by great ministers, uh, Lenin and Tukhachevsky and so forth, just about the Mastikirovka, this doctrina, uh, which is very important in, in that kind of army and kind of politics. So how do you cope with people who are intended to, to do anything, even denying war crimes, humanity crimes? How, how do you do it? Because it's quite different that when I was at the, the operation in French civil protection, when I, there was an explosion in a nuclear plant and there was no harm of uh, radioactive, no risk of radioactive, but immediately at once we communicate saying we don't know nothing, we just know that everybody's in charge. But this is very different because it is a planned attack on the very, on the very treasure of our democracy, which is truth. How do you cope with this? I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, I think here, uh, here there is a, it's a broader question that, uh, than only uh, emergency services. And I think wh one thing at least ha that we have seen since the beginning of the crisis of the Ukraine, Ukrainian war is more and more actors uh, dealing with uh, disinformation, dealing with disinformation t campaign being active to try to document uh, what is happening online, to try to verify information is uh, one of my specialities is uh, open source, uh, open source intelligence or, or SINT. And this kind of organization like Bellingcat, for example, they have the skills to verify information rapidly. You have some analysts uh, some uh, uh, an, uh, in other organization analysts able to show that there are some inauthentic activities almost in real time, but here you need really to have the you need really to have some specific competencies, and uh, and if you are an emergency service, normally you don't have this kind of competencies, so, so and you have to focus primarily about managing the <laughs> crisis on the field. So the idea, the, the idea is for me, for this kind of attacks, is more to help to develop this broader civil society, uh, uh, civil society organizations that have these skills to help to fight back. But at the end, as I said, there are so many incoherent. Uh, it's a lot about pushing. Uh, only so in distrust, there are so many messages, and only doing fact checking. Uh, it's not enough, so it's really more about uh, showing that you are a trustworthy uh, source of information and then pushing back a bit, but you, you can't solve 100% of this issue, at least uh, from my perspective. Thank you. Good night, everybody.